Good? All right. Thank you, kids, for doing that. That was awesome. I was paying attention in the back, and I learned a lot. And basically, guys, what we need to keep in mind is that as we journey through the book of Matthew, everything is important. So we can't just come in here and... and, and in fact, this is one of the problems with pe- preachers altogether, and I know because I was, you know, for a long part of my life, one of them, where you just come to the Bible, find a word you like, and then start talking about it without any consideration as to, well... What did the author try to say? What was his idea behind the whole thing? So those are the things that we need to be always aware of. So let's see if you guys were paying attention today to the kids bringing all these good things out. Jorge told us a very important principle in Bible reading, which is we, can't, we can come to the text with our own questions and say, God, why am I lonely? And try to find an answer. But the problem and what frustrates a lot of people when they study the Bible is that the Bible not all the times answer our questions. You know why? Because most of the times the Bible doesn't care about our questions. <laughs> you know, that's sort of weird to say in this culture today, but sometimes it's necessary. You know? Many of the things that we're interested in, many of the things that we think is important, the Bible doesn't think it's that important. And that's the cool thing about Bible study. It's not only about giving us answers, but allowing us to become people who ask better questions. And when we're in, in, the, in tune with the text, then the text was going to give us many more, much more answers than we anticipated. So that's the cool thing about that. So the first question that we see in the text is obviously right there in verse 13. Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan, and then, John, and then he wanted to be baptized by John, and John said, I need to be baptized by you. There's a whole problem. And the first question, which Kayleen brought up, which was very good, is why is Jesus getting baptized in the first place? And they did phenomenal ex- jobs explaining that. In the previous chapter, in Matthew chapter 3, John the Baptist is baptizing people for the first time ever in the Bible. There's not a lot of baptism going on in the Bible. It's like a, a new thing happening out of the blue. And it's weird. I mean, why is the guy throwing people inside of the water? What's going on there? And Kayleen gave us the answer. John's ministry is about reconciling the hearts of the Father to the children and the children to the fathers. Malachi chapter 4. The new Elijah comes and opens the door for people to have the same experience as their fathers in the past. And what does that all mean? That means that God is still faithful to the covenant. He will still send His Messiah. He will still have control over history. We should not lose hope. So He invites everyone to participate once again into a life of covenant with God by allowing people to go through the waters. Why? Because their fathers in the past, the beginning of Israel happened when everybody went through the waters of the Red Sea and into the desert. That's how life with God begins as Israel. So John is inviting everybody to go through the waters and go to the desert of life but in a different way now, trusting in God. So this is why Jesus is getting baptized. It's not because he's a sinner and needs to... No, keep in mind that the Bible has many metaphors or ideas for baptism, but the one in Matthew has nothing to do with sins. It has everything to do with once again becoming part of this larger Israelite family. Are you guys with me so far? Yes or no? So he is inviting everybody. Come, return, confess your sins. Yes, returning, turning away from everything that's selfish is important. And then I want you to experience what our fathers experienced. And this is why Jesus shows up and says, I want to do that too. Why? Because baptism in the Bible is the beginning of a journey of trust in God and not the end of the journey. So Jesus himself wants to say, himself wants to say I'm part of that story. I want to embody everything that Israel went through. And that's such a beautiful thing to think about. You know, Jesus is... a, a, a a God who teaches us that power is not found in power, but in in weakness. In other words, He's going through the waters and doing everything humanity went through so that when we come to Him, we're not finding in Him a foreigner who just came from heaven to sit on a human throne and then determine how things would be. No, the first episode of Jesus is Him going through the waters to show us that His true power is in following the steps of humanity. It's in weakness. And this is why we can come to Him with a renewed assurance that in Him we have somebody we can relate to because He went through that which He asks us now to go through again. So that's a pretty cool thing. Good job, Kayleen. That's why Jesus shows up to be baptized. To once again show that He is part of the family of Israel. That that story is His story as well. And He's not only giving us an example to go through baptism and begin a life with God, 
But he's following the example of Israel as well. So it's a fascinating thing there. The second thing that Jumalee did a phenomenal job. Second question is, why is John refusing to baptize Jesus? Did you see that? Jesus comes, I want to be baptized. And John says, nope. Who am I? Oh, Lord. Such an important thing to think about. How many times in our life as well, we sort of, because of our feelings of incoherence or inconsistency or sin, we say, God, I can't do anything for you. I can't do anything for the community because I'm so broken. And here's Jesus trying to show John something powerful, not only to him, but to all generations afterwards. And Jesus cannot do it because John is feeling unqualified. You see. So that always makes me think about how much do I you know, block, how, 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 how many times in my life have I blocked God from doing good things just because I feel like I'm not good enough or that I'm broken. or that See, that's part of the old religion of the Bible. Old religion of the Bible, if I sin, I'm very, the, the fake old religion. The old religion was all good, but that's how we twisted it in our human religion is, I am broken, I cannot do anything, Lord, I am a man of impure lips, Isaiah. And then Peter later will say, I cannot wash your feet. And then Jesus says, if you don't let me do this, then you have never understood anything about what I'm trying to teach. In other words, keep your incoherences, your your lack of confidence in yourself in check. Because God wants to use you just as broken as you are, just as messed up as you are to do great things. And sometimes we don't do anything just because we think we're unfit. And the Bible is a story about unfit people, Jorge, doing great things. Because they're open to the action of God. And that's what John needs to understand today. So that was a summary of what you guys did. High fives, good job. Well done. Now let's get to the end of this. Why is Jesus getting baptized? Why is John refusing to baptize Jesus? It's all there. Now let's go to the last few verses here that we have. And they are in verse 15. So, side note before we get there. Isn't it interesting? I don't know if you guys remember this from last week or not. But John the Baptist in the, in the same chapter is saying, Sis, the one coming after me will baptize you with fire and the Holy Spirit and you are all vipers and he will cut the tree from the root and throw stuff in the fire. It's really strong stuff, John the Baptist. The guy is like on fire. And then you're expecting Jesus to show up like throwing fire all over the place. And the first time Jesus appears is right now. He says, I want to be baptized in the water. So John is all confused. Like, Who is this person? I said you're coming with fireworks, but now you... So I love how unexpected Jesus is. When you read the Gospels, you'll see this. Do you think you, we get a grasp on who Jesus is? Well, part of, of the faith, with God, faith in God and the journey with Jesus is becoming completely open to the unexpectedness of who Jesus is. He doesn't come to sort of quench your desires to see Him throw fire all over the place. He comes as Jesus. He didn't come as God only, he didn't come as man only, he came as Jesus. And that should help us understand this unexpectedness there. So verse 15, let's get there and let's put all the pieces back together. And then let's go eat some good food. Are you guys ready for that too? Yes or no? Yes, good, let's go. Verse 15, <clears throat> but Jesus answered him, let it be so now, John, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness then he consented. Confronted by the proposal of Jesus, John refuses to do what he has asked at first. This reminds me of our society today, in fact. Now that I'm thinking of it. Have you, are you guys on Facebook? Yeah? Have you seen like the political battles on there where people post things and then it becomes a whole thing? Have you seen that? Yeah? Especially these days of impeachment, no impeachment, election. It's a mess out there. And Brazil is even worse. So if people feel like it's bad here. I'll take you to Brazil. The society is split in half over this candidate and the other candidate, and it's a war. And when I look at John refusing to see Jesus or refusing to do what he's doing, I'm reminded of our society today that we get so stuck into our understanding of the world, into our ideas, that even Jesus is not good enough for whatever we want to happen, Right? That reminds me of our society today. Are you with me, Wendy? I read the New Mexican every day. I see it there too. It's all over the place. 
we're all so caught up with our ideas that we are unwilling to look at the other and understand what they're talking about. We're all more excited about politics and other things than excited about the kingdom of God bursting forth of this old world in our life every day. That's how bad it's getting these days. We're so caught up with the politics of everything that we're sort of like John. Even Jesus is not good enough for our religious expectations. But just substitute religion for politics and then you're sort of closer to what I'm talking about here. Crazy. Anyway, it's time for us to talk about this little word. Jesus comes to John and it seems like a magic word. Because suddenly John says, I'm not going to do anything. And then he says, righteousness. And then John says, oh, okay, let's get you baptized. It's like a little magic word. He mentions this must happen because to fulfill all righteousness. Now, righteousness is a word we're going to get back to as we study Matthew. In fact, when we get to the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus will say, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. So right now we're going to have an introduction to that. Right now we need to keep in mind that righteousness simply means right here. Are you guys with me so far? Yes or no? Right doing. That's it. Righteousness means doing what is right. In other words, I let go of whatever I think is right. And I say, okay, I will do what you're telling me to do. And I will trust that this is the right way. This is the beginning of a life of faith, in fact is understanding that righteousness or doing what is right is not only up to you and your mind and clever ideas. Doing what is right is listening to what God is saying and following that even if it does not make sense to us. And this is the most countercultural thing that could ever happen because like I said, we live in a society that is completely, to some extent, obviously not everybody is like that, but the pattern of our society is I will not let go of my convictions and my ideas because this is the reasonable thing to do. And while there's a space for us to have strong convictions about things, biblical faith sort of nudges that into a different direction. And that is, yes, I have my convictions, but I'm not in the center of the universe. I do not know all things. So the journey of faith begins with humbleness, humility to recognize that, yes, I have some ideas, but maybe I'm not right about all things. Are we together, yes or no? So righteousness means what? Right doing, right action, doing what is right. And it seems like a little magic word because once John understands this now, he says, okay, you are the anointed, you are the promised Messiah to come, and you're telling me that this is the right thing, I'll submit. It's a beautiful image. And then he baptizes Jesus. Well, now let's come to the good part. Are you guys ready for the good part? This is my favorite part of the story. Right here. Verse 16 and 17. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately He went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to Him, and He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on Him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is My beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Now, you guys, so we have many visitors here with us today. Let me just give you a, a five-second summary of what's going on here. Matthew is not writing the Gospel of Matthew for us to just pick up words and say, Amen, Hallelujah, let me go now and have dinner. He is writing within a context. I mentioned this in the last sermon last week. You can check, out, check it out online. And I told this to Jorge earlier today to explain it to him as well. We are going this year, we, right now this year, we're going through a lot of things in 2020, Right? Yes or no? We have a virus going on in China and spreading around the world, do we not? Yes, we have this whole politics thing of election this year and primaries. And is our society talk, talking about this? Yes or no? Yes. So for instance, if I told you guys an expression like, make America great again, would you know what I'm talking about? We do. What we, some of what Mary does it. But let's just use this as an illustration. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? Make, keep, or whatever. And you can use any other sentence. I'm not saying this is right or wrong. I'm just using it so you can understand this simple point. When you mention an expression like that, we know what the expression means because we're living here in the United States. We know exactly who likes to talk about this and who talks about this all the time. But let's say somebody from Brazil came over like Emmanuel, right? Coming over the other day. And here's, make America great again. Somebody, he hears that expression. He says, oh. Great, yeah, sure. It needs to be great. I don't know what again means, but sure, let's go. Fine. 
He doesn't understand what, 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 we're, what, what we're dealing with. Why? Because he's not inserted in our culture, in our society, and in our discourse. Are you guys with me so far? Yes or no? So he can understand the words, make, great, again, everything, but he doesn't understand the broad picture of what that means. Are you guys with me? Yes or no? This is what we do with the Bible. We come to the Bible, we pick up words, we think we know what they mean, but we don't because we don't understand the big picture. Now, the big picture here is that this story of Jesus is not detached from the entire Old Testament. In other words, things have happened so that when Jesus shows up, we know exactly what he's talking about, we know exactly who he is and what he's set to do. So when we hear words like, he came to the water and the Spirit came down and hovered upon him, and we say, amen, what a great thing, that's baptism, it's great. We need to stop and say, wait, where have I heard this before? Where have I seen this before? Now with you who are with me every Tuesday night for Bible study, we're studying Genesis, you know where we have seen this before, right? Where have you seen water, the Spirit hovering, and then God saying something? When have we seen that? Genesis chapter 1, first chapter of the Bible, we have the same elements. Water, Spirit, voice of God, and when we see Jesus getting baptized in the waters, Spirit hovering, and God speaking, we need to pause and say, whoa, this is creation all over again. And then you have to step back and say, why am I seeing the same things of creation once again? And the answer is because, guys, the baptism of Jesus, Matthew is writing it so we can understand it represents a new creation. The ministry of Jesus will recreate the entire world upon a whole new platform, and it's a beautiful thing. That voice that spoke to create all things has become flesh, and now will dwell in our midst. And isn't it beautiful how Matthew paints that picture? So the baptism of Jesus is presented to us as a new creation. The world is going to be recreated through this person now, and it's an amazing thing. Now to me, the most amazing thing is how the text ends. The voice of God in this text doesn't say, let there be light. It says, no, no, no. You are my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Now while the world, sis, was created with the voice of God saying, let there be light. The new world God is creating through Jesus will be created through what is said right here and right now. You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now let's understand that for Jesus for a second. You guys have been with me since Matthew chapter 1. Has Jesus done any miracle so far? Yes or no? Nope. None. Has He spoken any great speech so far? Yes or no? No, this is the first time He appears. He has done absolutely nothing, and yet God comes to him and says, you are loved. In you I am pleased. And the question is, why? And the answer is, we live in a society where in order for you to be loved, you have to do many things. We have to prove that we're good. We have to prove that we are worthy. We have to prove that we obey. We have to prove many things. But when we come to the gospel of Jesus Christ, one very important thing you need to keep in your mind is that you're loved regardless of what you have done or regardless of what you're doing. And this is the word that will recreate this new world. Christianity, which is a big word which we'll talk about in the future, faith in Jesus begins at this very point when I understand that I have to do absolutely nothing to be loved by God. It was true for Jesus in the words, you are my beloved child, echo now through the centuries and reach us here in Santa Fe today to remind us that if you had a horrible week, that if you made poor decisions, you're the beloved of God. And faith in God begins at this moment where I accept that truth for my life. You see, there's, there's a whole supermarket of love out there who's going to try to sell you different ideas of love, and like I said, that you have to do many things in order to be loved. But may you know that the journey with Jesus begins by us embracing this simple truth, that we are loved. Pastor, I haven't done anything. That's fine, you're loved. Pastor, but I have done, that's, that's cool, you're still loved. It cannot be possible, I understand, because I live in the same society you do, but guess what? You're loved. 
And love came down to show us what that love means by living, serving, dying, and showing us that true love is a love that is completely connected to others, in givenness to others. And that's just a marvelous thing. Are you guys with me? Yes or no? Isn't this beautiful? Yes or no? I tell you, man, I've read a bunch of books. I'm not the apologetic kind of pastor. So now you have to believe in Jesus. No, you can believe in whatever you want. But to me, it's a beautiful image. How I've been to other religious circles and I have read religious texts. And in a lot of them, you have to do a lot of stuff in order to earn whatever. Not here, though. Here, love is already given. Love is already given without you doing absolutely nothing because only then can we love others in the same manner. My grandfather died a few years ago and I used to make some videos of him talking just for me to remember his voice and I just love the man. And one of the last videos I made you know, of him was during Christmas. It's on my Instagram page. You can still go back and see it. And he's saying, guys, love has been manifested to us in this. That God gave His own Son for us while we were still sinners. While we were still selfish and while we didn't care for anything, Dolores. God gave us His Son. Why? Because love generates love. Forgiveness generates forgiveness. Kindness generates kindness. So it would have been impossible for God to say, well, let's wait a little bit to see if they deserve love and then I'll give love as sort of a reward Not in the Bible. God loves so that love can take over our heart and our life and our perception of the world and flourish within us so that we can love others just the same. So that we can give love without reserve. So that we can give forgiveness and kindness because that has been given to us without us asking, needing, or accepting our condition in the first place. That's it. Through Jesus, a new world is being created. Water, spirit, and a new voice that doesn't say, let there be light, but says, you are all loved. And now a new creation will take form because of those beautiful words that Jesus heard and that we now hear today as well. Amen, friends. Can we leave now knowing that we're loved? Yes or no? That's the great challenge now. I can only take you up to the door now. You've got to walk the rest of the way. And the rest of the way is... Do I believe that I am loved? Will I live now the Sunday, Monday, Tuesday knowing that I am loved? Or will I seek love in places where I know I won't find it? (laughs) I can take you there. I can only take you up to the door. You're loved. Turn to the person next to you and say you're loved. Now to the other side. You're loved. You're loved. Good. So may we believe and may we trust in this love. Amen? Let's pray together and let's go eat food. But most most importantly of all, you are loved. Very good. Let's pray and we're going to do something before we go up. So just wait here a moment. Let's pray together. Close your eyes or open them. Do what you think is best and let's pray. Dear God, thank you for reminding us that we are loved. No matter what we have done, no matter what we're doing right now, we're loved. So may we believe in that love and may we live by it every single day. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.